Hello, I'm James Holland and I'm a historian of the Second World War. History Hit is a bit like Netflix, but purely for history. And we've got hundreds of hours of historical documentaries going all the way back to classical times, right through to the Cold War and beyond. Use the word war stories, all one word, for a massive discount when you join up. Superweapon straight out of the comic book multiverse. The ancient Mongol curse that almost destroyed the Soviets. The Big Bang that diverted the Blitz. And a bird brain scheme to stave off nuclear winter. A new kind of war. Conflict on a scale never seen before or since. This is war at its weirdest incredible experiments. This has got to be one of the most bizarre weapons ever mooted in the history of warfare. What is even crazier is that it seems to work. Mysterious events. This is brilliant. You couldn't make this up. Unexplained phenomena. This is all crazy. I kind of don't even know where to begin with this. When a world goes to war with itself, things get really weird. December 1952, SS Obergruppenführer Jakob Sporenberg is about to be hung for war crimes. Sporenberg worked at this really sinister Nazi secret facility called Der Riese, and he was in charge of 60 crack Nazi scientists. He was responsible for a top secret project called The Bell. What we've got here is like something out of a Marvel comic or a kind of pulp fiction novel from the 70s. It's really lurid, but it's true. You can almost picture him sitting on a big leather chair as he gives the command with a cat on his lap. He pulls no punches and has everybody who works there murdered. Some think it was a super weapon. Some think it was a UFO. And some have even linked it to Roswell. What is so important that all who touch it will die to keep it secret? Nineteen forty-five. Allied intelligence hears rumors of a top secret Nazi base near the Czech border with Silesia. It is called Derisa. Derisa is not a very imaginative name. It means the giant. And this was uh, basically a research facility that was involved in creating Hitler's next generation of Wunderwaffe, the, the wonder weapons. Conventional weaponry had failed him, and what he needed was a weapon that would help him win the war. Nazi scientists at Derisa are said to have worked on the V rocket program, the world's first long range ballistic missile used to terrorize London. But that's the least of its secrets. One of the most mysterious things about Derisa is its enormous electricity supply. It's much more than you would expect for a conventional weapons program. A mysterious fuel is also spotted at the site. Workers on this site had apparently seen a red liquid, which was supposedly known as serum 525, which had a kind of gooey, uh, viscous quality to it. Now, it's said that this strange substance is poured into this big cylinder with these counter-rotating chambers, and this is supposedly the bell. No one knows what the bell is, but death swirls all around it. The thing about the bell is that anyone who got within 600 feet of it got really, really sick. It's said that animals who are within this zone develop these strange crystals within their bodies. Plants apparently would just start to degenerate, would turn into a sort of greasy gloop. Five scientists actually died in proximity to the bell because uh, if they got too close to it, their skin and tissue would literally liquefy and fall off of their bodies. So what on earth was it? What is the power that can simply melt people's flesh away from their bones?
A clue might lie in a mysterious structure found less than two miles southeast of Deriza. Another site linked to Deriza is this very enigmatic concrete framework which is known as the Henge. It's all these concrete pillars sticking out the ground arranged in a kind of concentric shape. If you just imagine a NASA launch pad, what it is is concrete pillars arranged in a circular fashion that is somehow connected to what they were doing. A launch site near a top secret facility. It would appear that the Nazis are reaching for the skies. What we do know is that by 1945, the Nazis have successfully developed the ME-262. Now, this was a fighter built by Messerschmitt that could nearly reach supersonic speeds. The Germans were very, very advanced. The V-1 rockets were jets. They, they, they came over Britain and they caused a great deal uh, of damage to towns and cities. The suggestion is that the bell might have been uh, connected with uh, a more impressive type of propulsion, so possibly early types of stealth aircraft, or even it could uh, literally lift something up into space. As the Red Army draws ever closer, the Bell's handler, Obergruppenführer Jakob Sporenberg, takes drastic action to keep its secrets out of Soviet hands. Sporenberg acts like an arch supervillain from a, a B-movie when he figures out that the uh, secrets of Teresa and what the bell is might fall into Soviet hands. He rounds up all 60 of the scientists working on this project and has them all shot. Sporenberg categorically refused ever to tell anyone what the bell was for or to reveal any details about what went on. Um, till the day he died. They hung him for war crimes in 1952, and whatever he knew, he took it to the grave with him. Or did he? In July 1947, a strange craft crash-landed near the US Air Force Base in Roswell, New Mexico. The military's press release stated that a flying disc had been discovered in the area, then changed a few days later to claim it was a weather balloon. Most of us know about the Roswell incident, in which it's widely supposed that an alien spacecraft crashed near Roswell in New Mexico. But there's a chance that actually what crashed at Roswell was not a UFO at all. The suggestion is that whatever the bell was and whatever was there was packed up by the Americans and taken to Area 51, and that they later reverse engineered this craft that the Germans had been working on. And there are some who even maintain that actually the Bell was the foundation of the US stealth aircraft program. Sounds plausible, but it has problems. Perhaps the biggest problem with it is that it wasn't actually the Americans who liberated Ares. It was the Russians who liberated Ares. Any information that was gleaned from this place wouldn't have gone to the Americans, it would have gone to the Soviets. Frankly, for me, it's very far-fetched, but of course it's less far-fetched than an alien landing. But there is another equally compelling explanation that neatly fits all the known facts surrounding the bell. A practical explanation for the death zone surrounding the bell, when you think about it, is really simple. All these stories of uh, people's flesh falling off them, developing hideous sort of mutations and illnesses, now to me, and I'm sure to a lot of other people, that sounds like one thing, radiation. Some witnesses from Deriza claimed that an isotope called thorium was present at the site. If the radioactive isotope thorium-232 was found at the testing site. This starts to make sense of what was going on. What seems more likely is that if it did exist, then the bell was a Nazi attempt at a heavy particle accelerator. The process is fairly straightforward. You take thorium-232, you bombard it with neutrons, and that becomes thorium-233. That then eventually becomes weapons-grade uranium 233. A variation of this process using uranium 238 could also create plutonium for atomic weapons without the need for a nuclear reactor. Throw this into the mix, and the pillars of the Henge near Deriza make a different kind of sense. 
it makes more and more sense when you take into account the henge because when you look at the construction of the concrete pillars, it could feasibly be the ruins of a cooling tower, um, which would suggest that in a very plausible place, a, a Nazi super weapons factory, they were actually developing nuclear fuel. They weren't necessarily successful, but what seems to me is that this was an attempt at producing some form of nuclear weapon. Just a few months after Deriza fell to the Soviets, Stalin established the Artsimas 16 research facility in the closed city of Sarov. Its job was to build an answer to America's atomic bomb. We're never going to know the exact story about this site. It will always remain very, very weird. But what we do know is that the Russians, very soon after capturing it, start to develop their own nuclear weapons program. Their official explanation is that they find 100 tonnes of uranium oxide in Berlin. It could be more likely that they found both the expertise and the type of structures and indeed the uranium at Deriza and not in Berlin. So when you add to this the clear secrecy that was surrounding the development of something here, it becomes plausible that what you're actually dealing with is the development of nuclear weapons. However, this theory is just too convenient for some. Some even say that it was part of a top-secret Nazi space program that was going to send Hitler and his acolytes out to the Aldebaran space constellation. It's quite a long way away. I've not been there myself. But that is where Hitler is now residing. And I guess they would live happily ever after and have their Third Reich there. Coming up... A British engineer realises German bombers use burning buildings to target their bombs. Brilliantly, his plan is low stuff up. The decoys he creates are a pyromaniac's dream. It's sort of a live-action theatre put on to deceive the Germans. Could these phantom cities save Britain from the Blitz? It could save hundreds, perhaps thousands of lives. September 1940. Britain is under siege. This is the Blitz, the Nazi terror bombing of Britain. It's horrific. It's night after night, German airmen taking to the skies over Britain and raining down death from above. To protect their homes, the citizens of Britain take extraordinary measures. Households are ordered to black out their windows, so no light can get out. It's taken incredibly seriously. Not only are there wardens on the ground enforcing the blackout, but there are spotter planes doing recce's at night, looking for lights showing. But there's also another reason for the blackout, and it involves blowing stuff up. Nineteen forty. The British government are using all kinds of tricks to make it more difficult for Luftwaffe pilots to navigate their way. Blackouts aren't the only method used to confuse the German bombers during the Blitz. You have smoke screens on the ground. They would set fire to tar to try and obstruct the German pilot's view. And barrage balloons full of hydrogen hoisted in the air to actually present a physical barrier um, against the Luftwaffe. Uh, you've got other things like searchlights that can blind them, or anti-aircraft guns. Sadly, that's still not enough to stop the Luftwaffe. There is only so much you can do to obscure German targets, to black them out. The reality is that the Germans will employ other methods to find their targets, and, and one example is Coventry, and nearly 600 people die and 40,000 buildings destroyed. The government is desperate to find a way to divert German bombers. A potential solution comes from a retired Air Ministry officer, Colonel J.F. Turner. He notices that the German bombers attack in waves. Now, the first wave is entirely reliant on using maps and location points in order to identify their targets. In the second wave, the pilots don't use maps, they just use the smoke and flames coming up from the ground. So, what if the smoke and flames could be used as a decoy? So, brilliantly, his plan is to go somewhere completely isolated, 
and blow stuff up. Because then the Germans will see flames and smoke and then they will follow the flames and the smoke and bomb nothing. It's genius. It's simple, but it's genius. For his idea to work, Turner will have to create massive sets lit up with giant pyrotechnic displays. Obviously, this isn't going to work if there's half a dozen Boy Scouts sitting around a campfire somewhere in Hertfordshire. You're going to have to be convincing. You're going to have to make it look like there's a city on fire on the ground. So basically, he's got to go large, otherwise he might as well go home. He decides to seek help from a very unusual source. Because the British weather is so notoriously evil, the British film industry typically has to make entire sets for towns undercover. So you've got a very skilled and capable workforce of producing dummy buildings very, very quickly. So what Turner and the production industry do is create fake buildings, fake fires, in a way that presents the illusion that the Germans have hit their target and destroyed a town. It's theater with a purpose beyond entertainment, theater for defense. It could save hundreds, perhaps thousands of lives. The urban decoys are nicknamed starfish, after the fluorescent sea creatures that illuminate the dark seabed. They employ every means of flammable substance, and what they do is build huge towers 20 foot high um, to try and mimic uh, buildings and industrial sites. You've got row upon row of diesel and paraffin tanks mounted on 20 foot uh, structures that when set alight will mimic a whole row of buildings being on fire. It's actually got a valve like a sink. What they do is they turn open the valve and the paraffin or the diesel flows onto hot coals creating flame and smoke. And this creates a massive orange ball whoosh of explosion that looks just like a bomb. As the German bombing raids become more frequent, the decoy program rises to new levels. So what they do is, it, it's chemistry, they take multiple um, flammable substances and they cover them with paraffin or oil or creosote to create different types of fires and, and different um, views from the air to make it look more convincing, to add layers to the spectre from above. You've got the boiler fire, which releases oil from a storage tank onto a hot steel tray. They then turn on another valve that's connected to a water tank, and that water pours on to the flames. You've then got white, hot flashes of fire leaping 40 foot right into the air. They have nearly 500 gallons of oil going into this, and they could make this burn for up to four hours. And a typical starfish site can contain up to 12 or 14 of these massive boilers. The grid fire is a metal grid um, and it's sprinkled with paraffin. It produces a steady yellow, smaller flame, which you would expect to see if, if there were multiple small fires in a locality. The amount of fuel a starfish site could get through is absolutely staggering. Some can use up 25 tonnes of fuel in just four hours. Others can use double that. The people creating these sites place themselves right in the firing line. There's no way that these sites were completely safe, though, because not only are you literally playing with fire on a massive scale, but don't forget the object of these sites is to make the Germans come and bomb you. So, yes, you might be 600 yards away pushing a button to get this stuff rolling, but that's nothing to say that some member of the Luftwaffe isn't going to bomb you as well. The British are constantly improving the designs to make the starfish sites as convincing as possible. To play this game correctly, these sites have to be set up somewhere just close enough to the targets that the Germans want to bomb to create the illusion that they actually hit their target. They have to be plausibly close to what they're trying to imitate. They're set up in places near enough to existing factories and dwellings, but in open spaces where it's hoped the bombs will fall harmlessly. But it's not just the Allies who are at it. The Germans were not above employing deception on their own, and a good example of a one-off case is the town of Constance that was right on the Swiss border. The Swiss were neutral, so the Americans and the English did not want to accidentally bomb them. And so what the town did as they decided to leave their lights on all throughout the war. We all know that Switzerland are neutral, and that um, if you then went and 
bombed the living daylights out of one of its towns, you'd be in trouble. Consequently, the town of Constance never got bombed throughout the entire war. The Nazis also make their own decoy sites as well. In Holland, they make an entire airfield out of wood. They use wooden hangars, they use wooden aircraft, you know, you name it, they make a wooden replica. Unfortunately for the Germans, they've taken so long to build the thing that the RAF um, have watched them construct it and know it's all wood and know there are no genuine aeroplanes there. So in true RAF fashion, what they do is they send up one lone aeroplane and he trundles over to the wooden airfield and drops a bomb on it. Um, but the bomb is made of wood, just to take the mickey. It's one of those ideas that this sounds good, but actually in practice, it never really works. By the end of the war, 237 starfish sites protect 81 locations. One estimate suggests that about 968 tonnes of ordnance is dropped on the decoys during the Blitz. That's almost 1,000 tonnes of bombs that could have otherwise devastated British cities. I can only imagine how awesome it must have been for some military guy to turn up at your job and say, uh, I'm going to give you limitless resources to blow things up and make stuff burn, and you're going to get paid for it. blowing stuff up and getting paid for it. Yeah, that's the job I'd want. Coming up, a medieval warlord's curse threatens Russia with horrific retribution. Whoever uncovers this tomb shall unleash an invader even more terrible than I. But Joseph Stalin wants the body dug up. It's quite creepy, actually. I think it's safe to say that if you weigh up whether you're more terrified of Stalin or the dead warlord, then you're gonna dig up the body no matter what. The mummy rises from the tomb... <laughs> ..and its curse is unleashed upon the world. Just as the elders predicted, a terrible invader does sweep across the country in the form of Adolf Hitler. AD 1405, the Mongol Emperor Tamerlane the Great embarks on the most ambitious conquest of his blood-soaked reign. Tamerlane was one of the greatest warlords in Mongol history. He is a quintessential, brutal, medieval Mongol warlord. He invaded Turkey and Iran and Syria and Iraq, Russia, parts of Eastern Europe. He managed to acquire this vast empire at the expense of 17 million lives. But Tamerlane does not conquer China. China conquers him. It's a lot bigger than he anticipated, and the natives are a lot better at defending it. The terrain favours them as well, and obviously they know it better than he does. In the harsh conditions of the Chinese winter, he grows sick and he dies. His body was taken back to Samarkand, uh, in what's now Uzbekistan. And there it's entombed in this giant mausoleum called gur ir amir A warning is engraved on the front of his tomb. When I rise from the dead, the world shall tremble. This, of course, is the classic kind of curse from the mummy's tomb, if you like, and no one really expects it to come true. After all, the spirit of Tamerlane is dead, and gone. Or is it? Nineteen forty one, and Uzbekistan is dominated by a ruler even more ruthless than the infamous Tamerlane. Joseph Stalin is in control of the USSR, and that includes Uzbekistan. Now Stalin sees in Tamerlane a kindred spirit. He's not wrong, there were similarities. And I think he's probably thinking along the lines of a glorious, successful warlord, whereas anybody else might be thinking in terms of a complete sociopathic lunatic. So he's determined to find Tamerlane's tomb. Stalin sends eminent Soviet anthropologist Mikhail M. Gerasimov to Gur el Amir on the hunt for Tamerlane's tomb. Karazimov is a pioneer in the field of forensic sculpture. His big speciality is reconstructing historical figures. So what Stalin decides to do is dig up Tamerlane and have what is essentially a life-size doll made. 
It's quite creepy, actually. Stalin wants Tamerlane's body, and he wants it because he wants to recreate him. I suppose so he could look into the eyes of this kindred spirit. Why a life-size doll? Surely if you're going to go all to that trouble, maybe you would move, like Lenin, you would move his embalmed remains to Moscow and have people visit it and say this was essentially like one of our forebearers and stuff. I want a doll so I know what he looked like. You just think when you've got too much money and too much power, you end up doing silly things. Gerasimov arrives in Gur Air Amir and begins work on excavating the mausoleum. As tomb after tomb is ransacked, the Soviets become more and more confident that they are on the verge of discovering Tamerlane's final resting place. Local Islamic leaders in Uzbekistan are absolutely horrified by this idea. They claim that if the tomb is opened, it will unleash Tamerlane's curse. Interestingly, Stalin is a very superstitious man, as Russians are wont to be. Um, and he, but he takes absolutely no notice of the fact that digging up Tamerlane to make his doll is horrific. It was far more important to Stalin to be able to, to dig up this man, to look at this 14th century counterpart, this equally bloodthirsty individual, to travel through time and look in a mirror. The excavation team finds the tombs of Tamerlane's sons and grandsons. Then, on the 19th of June, 1941, they locate a giant sarcophagus topped by a massive slab. They have discovered Tamerlane's tomb. As if the original inscription um, about a trembling world um, isn't enough and all of the local leaders running around screaming with their hands in the air, it gets worse. As Gerasimov and his team remove this jade covering, they reveal an even more terrifying inscription. Whoever uncovers this tomb shall unleash an invader even more terrible than I. This is the Russians' last chance to stop, but they don't take it. In the face of the wailing cries of the fearful Muslims gathered nearby, Gerasimov orders his men to break the seal on Tamerlane's resting place. At the moment they open the tomb, everybody smells this strange, sweet smell. The local workers recoil in horror. They absolutely believe that Tamerlane's ghost is on the move. Gerasimov is not so superstitious. What it was, was the embalming fluid, which has been kept under wraps for centuries and centuries, suddenly being exposed to the air. So you've got a mixture of what? Of rose, of camphor, of frankincense, of different oils. And exactly the same thing was noted when tombs in Egypt were opened up. Even so, members of the local Islamic clergy plead with the Russians, telling them not to do any more because something bad is going to happen. They claim that three days after Tamerlane's body is removed, the curse will come upon them, and a mighty invader and slayer of men will come to them and kill them all. Gerasimov continues regardless. I think it's safe to say that if you weigh up whether you're more terrified of Stalin or more terrified of a dead warlord who's been gone since the 14th century, then you're going to dig up the body no matter what. The curse of Stalin is going to be far greater than the curse of Tamerlane. Gerasimov takes the body straight back to Leningrad. In the Institute of Material Culture, he begins to prepare Tamerlane's skeleton for reconstruction. Then, the unthinkable happens. On the 22nd of June, 1941, exactly three days after Tamerlane is removed from his tomb, Germany invades the Soviet Union. Just as the elders predicted, a terrible invader does sweep across the country in the form of Adolf Hitler. If you think Tamerlane was bad and you think Stalin was a lunatic, Adolf Hitler and his forces have invaded after the said three days, which you would have to assume means that somewhere Tamerlane was shaking his fist and saying, I told you so. Operation Barbarossa is the code name for the Nazi invasion of Russia, and it's much more terrible than anything Tamerlane ever envisaged. Hitler's invasion was intended to be and was 
truly devastating. To put it really brutally, the aim of the Nazis is simply to invade and colonize the western part of the Soviet Union. To give the Germans what he called Lebensraum, living room. To be able to exploit the people, to be able to exploit minerals, oil, materials, farmland. Everything that Germany needed was to be taken from the Soviet Union. The Nazis wanted to enslave them, starve them, massacre them. By the end of World War II, something like 27 million Russians have died at the hands of the German invasion. This is a war to the death. The USSR soon becomes mired in a desperate struggle for survival. In the first month alone, Stalin loses more than 600,000 troops. As this long, devastating war of attrition, which millions died, was taking place, Gerasimov actually started to doubt himself. He started to wonder whether, actually, the curse might be coming true. And so he actually writes to Stalin and outlines his fears. What he essentially says to Stalin um, in his letter is, do you think maybe we really did unleash a massive, terrifying curse? And if so, should we go and put him back where we got him from? It would appear that Stalin is convinced because he actually now orders Tamerlane's remains to be sent back to Samarkand and to be reinterred in the mausoleum. The final and most bizarre twist of this tale occurs as the warlord is returned. As Tamerlane's remains have flown over Stalingrad, it's that point when the Russians launch Operation Uranus, which is their attempt to beat back the Germans from that city. Tamerlane is given an amazing burial with four Muslim honours and uh, he's put in a wonderful mausoleum and suddenly the entire Soviet war effort takes a huge turn for the better. So believe what you want, was it a coincidence um, or was it because they put him back where he belonged? I mean, presumably that's just a coincidence. I mean, what real effect could the return of a long-dead leader's body to his tomb have on this terrible, vicious war that's actually being fought in the moment. Couldn't have any effect on it at all, could it? Could it? Coming up, a bird-brained scheme to thaw bombs during the Cold War. So imagine you're outside in the bitter cold uh, of Central European winter, and you put on a blanket, but that's not keeping you warm. What do you do next? You hug a chicken. You heard me right. Chickens. Yes, chickens. You know, poultry that flaps and flies. Actual chickens. When the war goes cold, things get even weirder. 1954. The Cold War is raging and the British Army is on high alert for a Soviet invasion of West Germany. The Ministry of Defense is seriously worried that NATO won't be able to stop a massed Soviet armor attack. If that happens, then the Russians have got a foothold in Western Europe, and from there, they can launch their nuclear missiles against the British Isles. Now, bear in mind that in 1954, the majority of people can absolutely remember the Blitz. German bombs raining down on British cities. The British still remember what the Nazis did, launching V1s from France and V2s from the Netherlands. But of course, nuclear technology has given weaponry with much greater firepower, huge devastation. Destruction would be total. The Soviets must be stopped. So how do you defend against this? The answer is chickens. That's right, you heard me. Chickens. Yes, chickens. You know, poultry that flaps and flies. Actual chickens. This is the story of one of the most bird-brained ideas in the entirety of the Cold War. In July 1957, the British Army Council orders the construction of 10 nuclear landmines. Codename, Blue Peacock. These will be buried in strategic locations close to the West German border. The 
The story behind Blue Peacock at first sounds like a completely sensible, normal idea that's gone a little bit off the rails. That is, so long as you think the idea of planting nuclear landmines is rational and logical. The boffins thought that if they buried a series of nuclear weapons along the West German border, they could trigger them with an electronic timer when massed waves of Soviet tanks overran them. This would have had two devastating effects. First, these landmines would have vaporized huge tracts of land, wiping out Soviet tanks, and also denying access to this contaminated land to the Russians. And of course, the second effect is that this radioactive contamination would have infected the area for years and years and denied the Russians any access for almost decades. Nor, for that matter, would anybody. The Blue Peacock device consists of a plutonium core surrounded by a sphere of high explosives, all encased in steel. This landmine is actually based on an existing nuclear weapon called the Blue Danube, which is already in service with the RAF. But the Blue Peacock is a lot bigger and it's going to weigh seven tons. Each bomb is expected to produce a nuclear yield of 10 kilotons, which is about half the yield of the plutonium device that was dropped over Nagasaki in 1945. The device, complete with anti-tamper mechanisms, is tested in a flooded gravel pit near Seven Oaks in Kent. This should create a crater 375 feet across and 640 feet deep if the blast takes place 35 feet below ground. Blue Peacock on the surface seems pretty powerful and pretty versatile. It can be set to be triggered automatically by a timer, set as far as eight days in advance. By a wire from several miles away. It's also got some pretty highly sophisticated anti-tampering devices that will cause it to go off if you try to fiddle with it. If it's pierced by gunfire, if someone attempts to move it, so there's not a lot the Russians can do if they stumble across it. So clearly, the scientists at Boffins, they've thought of everything. Haven't they? Well, almost everything. There's a bit of a flaw with the bomb's components. They are very sensitive to very cold temperatures. Below minus 20 degrees Celsius, the bomb's components become brittle and unreliable. Now, bear in mind, we're talking about Central Europe. We're talking about uh, a bomb that may well have to be used in winter. And bear in mind, we're talking about the invading force being the Soviets. And I don't think anyone is in any doubt that the Soviets were very good at fighting in winter. The Siberian winds over Germany's eastern border can cause the air temperature to plummet as low as minus 20 degrees centigrade, even lower underground. For the Blue Peacock mines to work, they must be kept above minus 20 until detonated. Engineers building Blue Peacock have to come up with a way of warming the device. The first thing they thought of was put a blanket over them. That's what you'd do if you were cold. This will insulate them and keep them warm. But these blankets just don't work in freezing German weather. The problem with the blankets is that they too become very brittle and cumbersome in the cold weather. So plan one didn't work. So a new idea is proposed, and it's one of the most extraordinary ideas in the entire Cold War. So imagine you're outside in the bitter cold of Central European winter, and you put on a blanket, but that's not keeping you warm. What do you do next? You hug a chicken. You heard me right. Chickens. Chickens are pretty warm. Their average body heat is at 107 degrees Fahrenheit. So these are cozy chicks. If you put 40 chickens in a box, it will raise the ambient temperature so the chickens themselves can insulate the mines. The idea is that within the sort of structure of the bomb and its emplacement, you place this big coop of chickens that are going to keep the bomb metal from not going brittle and keep the wiring functioning. They were actually creating an aviary inside a nuclear bomb. Now, if the Soviets come across it and hear this weird subterranean clucking sound and they dig down to investigate, the whole thing's going to go boom and 
that's a lot of Russians killed and a lot of dead chickens. This is all crazy. I kind of don't even know where to begin with this. Uh, first of all, how do you keep the chickens alive? Rubber tubes allow air to enter the delivery device. To feed the avians, there are seed dispensers which they can peck at to access sustenance. How do you keep the chickens from pecking at the nuclear bomb that they're keeping warm? The avian containment module will constrain the birds and prevent them from pecking at the delicate wiring inside the delivery device. And you've got another problem with all these chickens in their nuclear coop. They're going to poo everywhere. 40 chickens. That's a lot of poop. You're going to have this nuclear bomb, which is going to have chicken poo all over it. So I certainly don't know what the effect of chicken feces would be on the very, very uh, precise workings of a nuclear bomb. Waste will be disposed of in the appropriate manner. Estimates suggest that the avians can survive in optimal conditions for at least a week, after which they will be overrun by the enemy and the delivery device will be triggered. This is absolutely insane. No one designed nuclear weaponry to feature poultry in. Come on, boffins, you really haven't thought this one through. Chickens, you're kidding. Two prototypes of the nuclear landmine are built, but in February 1958, Operation Blue Peacock is abandoned. In the end, Blue Peacock is not dropped out of a humanitarian concern for the chickens. That concern is quite low on the pecking order. The problem is actually political. Because if you are setting off these nuclear landmines in Germany, which of course, you know, it's a friendly country in the 50s, and if you have these plans to do so in the event of an invasion, the headlines are going to look pretty bad. British planning to nuke German soil in event of Soviet invasion. Just think, you would be putting a whole area uh, out of use for very many years. You're also risking nuclear fallout on friendly territory. It's not going to play well with our new ally and our recent former enemy. It's going to look bad because it looks like we're going to contaminate Germany rather than let it fall into the hands of the Russians. So what would start with the death of a few dozen chickens would end, potentially, with the entire globe incinerated. You know, that's politics, and it's got nothing to do with chickens. The Chicken Nukes program remains a secret until 2004, when Operation Blue Peacock is declassified. Information about Blue Peacock was first revealed when the British National Archives announced a plan for an exhibit that would open on April 1st. Everybody thought it was an April Fool's joke, but it really wasn't. People really were planning to bury chickens with nuclear landmines. As the civil service made very clear, this is not an April Fool's story, they said. The civil service does not do jokes. Exactly. <laughs>